Perfect. Well, let's get started. Um, here to talk about uh, Mankato Avenue and the roundabouts. Uh, actually, continue a conversation that we had a month or so ago, which uh, we ran out of time and needed to uh, needed to have a further discussion on it. So, uh, Brian, do you want to start it out, or uh, how do you want to kick this off? City and, and MnDOT didn't believe that we answered all the questions and kind of ran out of time up against the, the public hearing. So this is a continuation to further answer questions and uh, have the dialogue on this project. With that, I'll turn it over to Brian, Chad or Dale. Brian, when you talk, can you move a little closer to the microphone, please? I'm like touching it. Well, get a little closer. Speak up. It's like it can get moved on to the next five inches or so. Uh, Dale or Chad, you want to go with that? Dale or Chad? <laughs> um, I think Dale was going to start it off. So, uh, Dale, maybe if you want to just go ahead and then I'll uh, take over maybe halfway through. Sure, I'll start off. Sorry about that. Uh, that sometimes you forget that pesky little mute button on your on your computer. Anyway, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for inviting us back and continuing our conversations about the 43 corridor, Mankato Avenue. Uh, we know it's an important one, so we wanted to make sure that we made ourselves available to get all of your questions answered, so we can leave the meeting tonight with everybody feeling and at least uh, in the know and and hopefully comfortable with what's going on. On the screen right now, everybody should be seeing uh, part of the layout for the roundabout concept. The intersection that's being shown right now is at 63 and 41. Just wanted to give you a, a quick view again of the roundabout corridor and highlight what a probably one of the more significant changes we've made. You can see that not much here has changed at 43 and 61. Uh, again, uh, the colors we're looking at, the yellow is pavement, red is raised median, uh, purple is sidewalks. The sort of orangish tan color is trail, uh, so mixed use trail. Blue is shoulders, and, and um, I think that's about all of them. So as we move in to town from Highway 61, you'll see at the intersection with Parks and Brewski, that is where the biggest changes occurred. Uh, we're zooming in a little bit. There's a raised median that's going to be in the middle of that intersection uh, where earlier we had shown that median completely closed off. So people coming to Brewski could only turn right and leaving Brewski could only turn right again. Um, this configuration will allow people coming off Highway 61 to make a left turn onto parks. And conversely, people who are heading down Mankato toward Highway 61 we'll be able to make a left turn into Brewski. Uh, we've talked with a lot of folks and they indicated that those movements were important to them. So we went round and round with the uh, geometrics unit at MnDOT and finally came to agreement on something that would allow those movements. So that, that's really the biggest change to this layout since you've seen it last. If we continue down the corridor, again, not much has changed at all. Uh, you can see where we move in front of Winona Health. Here's the next roundabout in line. Uh, same, we have pedestrian movements in all quadrants of the intersection. Um, keep going towards Sarnia, please. And we have, makes, uh, so, so everyone's aware, we have made accommodations with Burger King to handle their new facility that's going to be in the target parking lot. So our design works with what they are proposing to build. Here's the next intersection, uh, sort of in the east side of, of Winona Health, right by Mugby Junction. Again, we're just moving traffic through. We've made accommodations as best we can to allow all of those movements to make and to increase the safety as much as possible for bikes and pedestrians. Then finally, moving down to Sarnia. Not much there has changed. Um, You'll see there again too, just a reminder that we're gonna be replacing that box culvert that's under Mankato with this project. It's very old, it's very rough shape, so that will get replaced. 
Um, but here again, lots of lots of accommodations to manage the pedestrians and the bicyclists in the area, and still uh, safely let some drivers queue up if there's trains blocking the 43 or the Mankato crossing a little further into town. So everything that everything that we had heard, uh, we worked really hard to accommodate into this layout. Something else I, I want to just highlight as we move toward looking at the other option, um, a reminder that in the roundabout corridor, where we have four roundabouts, one of the inherent safety features is that it controls speeds. So uh, last time we talked, I just mentioned that a real safety hazard is when you have a large uh, divergence of speeds in a corridor. Um, roundabouts really help take care of that, but Chad is going to talk more about the safety in a little bit. I want to take a look specifically at the Highway 6143 intersection. If we were to go with a signalized intersection, uh, we would have to fix it, as you're seeing on your screen, to make sure that we could accommodate all the turning movements and through movements that need to occur. Uh, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the width of this pavement. We had talked last time generally that this, is, this would be a massive intersection. And you can see on that diagram, Highway 61, if a pedestrian was going to cross, it'd have to cross 150 feet of pavement. And if you were going to cross Highway 43, you'd have to cross 115 feet of pavement in one signal cycle. If you look at uh, the Federal Highway Administration's recommendations for how fast pedestrians can travel, a normal pedestrian, they call it their regular pedestrian, travels at about three and a half feet per second. They say older, a little more challenged individuals uh, travel at about 2.8 feet per second. And they recommend that if you're doing an intersection in the vicinity of an elementary school, you should be uh, planning for pedestrians to move through an intersection at two and a half feet per second. So figuring in a little delay time, uh, again, they say that the normal pedestrian starts once the walk signal comes on in 1.9 seconds and older in two and a half, that's sort of inconsequential. But looking at what it would take to cross this intersection for regular and older pedestrians, Highway 43 would take 33 seconds for a regular pedestrian to cross. It would take an older pedestrian about 41 seconds. And to cross Highway 61, it would take a regular pedestrian 43 seconds and an older pedestrian 54 seconds, almost a full minute to make it across that intersection. One of the things that ends up being dangerous there is we still have cars, if we were to do this configuration, cars that approach this intersection at high speed. Um, so that would be a piece of that we have there. Next is the roundabout intersection. And what I really want to point out here is all of the opportunities for pedestrians to sit in a safe area and the minimal pavements they need to cross at any given time. Uh, you, you can see the minimum width is coming into town, Highway 61, turning right to go down Mankato. That pavement width is 20 feet. And so that for those same pedestrians, the regular and older, it would take them six or seven seconds to cross that. And the maximum width of any roadway in this configuration is 32 feet. So those same pedestrians would take nine to about 11 and a half seconds to cross that. If you put yourself on any one of these sidewalks or the trail coming in, you can see that you have to cross, if you wanna cross the entire roadway, you cross one or two lanes going in one direction in a relatively short time, uh, then you are in a refuge area. Then you cross the next set of, and again, you move into a refuge area where you're safe. And then finally, you would cross that last third set of lanes to the trail on the other side of the facility. So if we look at times that pedestrians and bicyclists in this scenario are on those, on the pavement between the curves, um, they're four and a half to roughly almost six times longer on pavement where vehicles are moving in a traditional intersection than they are in this scenario. Uh, and we have slower speeds, which you'll see on the next slide. Here's the Highway 4361 intersection with speeds superimposed over the lanes uh, based on modeling as to what speeds we could expect to see. 
Uh, just so everyone can get their bearings, Quick Trip is down in the lower right-hand corner, uh, Fleet Farm in the top right, Dairy Queen, one of my favorite spots, would be up there in the top left. But you can see that people coming in at high rates of speed, 50, 55 miles an hour, uh, run into the curbs that we introduce before the roundabout. And that forces them to slow down. Um, 50, uh, if you're coming in on Highway 61 from the north, you can see that you're coming in at about 50 and you hit those first curves, you go down to 35. And on that approach, and really all of the approaches in this configuration, uh, vehicle speeds would be in the 20 mile an hour range when they get to the roundabout and somewhere in the 15 mile an hour range once they're operating within the roundabout. So a combination of those lower speeds, uh, shorter crossing distances, and built-in refuge areas is uh, one of the reasons that we still think that this is a very safe option for pedestrians and vehicles uh, in this corridor. With that, I think Chad, you're gonna take over and run us through a few things. Hey, thanks, Dale. I guess uh, I'm just gonna run through a couple slides here as well. But I guess the main thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, why we are here. And I guess when we started the project out, the, the limits really were Highway 61 to Sarnia. And we did not even include the Highway 61 intersection. But, you know, as we started looking more into the project, started, we met with people and found out what the issues are that are going on. Um, along with analyzing the crashes that have been occurring out there, you know, it became very evident that we really had to address the Highway 61 intersection as well. Um, just, you can note here, there's, within 10 years, we had 120 total crashes at the signal that have occurred already, um, including two fatals. We had 41 injury crashes that have happened. It's actually the second highest crash cost intersection in our entire district, which is um, roughly 11 counties in southeastern Minnesota. And that's based on, you know, we assign uh, a cost based on the severity of the crash. And this one is right near the top. Um, the existing signal has a three minute, over three minute cycle length during the peak periods. And a lot of that depends on, you know, what the traffic volume is at the time. But during the AM and PM peak, if you miss the, the green, you could be, you know, sit, essentially sitting there for two and a half, three minutes or more um, until you get the green again. And that's assuming that you would be able to make it through on that green before hitting with a red again by the next cycle. Um, you know, just obvious, Obviously, there's some real issues going on here that we want to address. So, you know, as, it, as Dale alluded to, we looked into it more and after evaluating both the signal and the roundabout, you know, the signal really came out on the top, top here, both from an operation standpoint, but safety is, you know, paramount or paramount for this intersection, not only vehicles, but we understand the pedestrians that want to get across here, um, bikers that are wanting to get across as well. So we submitted the project, um, actually this intersection for safety funding late last year, I believe it was November. Um, and actually in March, we were awarded the three and a half million due to the fact that it would be a, uh, um, the roundabout. So due to the safety benefits from that, we were able to achieve that funding. You wanna go ahead? I just wanted to maybe just summarize a little bit what Dale had said and then expand on it a little more. But, you know, just, just contrasting the two, and this is a very, you know, rough list, but probably the biggest points for each one of these is the traffic signal, the current one has safety issues, which is obvious by the crashes that have been occurring there. But we, in order to provide, you know, improved operations to serve the volume of traffic that's out there, we would have to add turn, we would have to add lanes. 
which like Dale said, we'd be adding additional left turn lane on each approach at a minimum. So, you know, you start adding lanes and we would not expect the safety to increase. It would actually likely could have the opposite effect. You know, by adding additional traffic, additional conflict points, it's that much more complicated of an intersection. So really the, the safety issue would still remain. If you look at the roundabout, you know, it's m many fewer conflict points, fewer number of lanes, the high speed nature of the crashes would basically be eliminated. Um, you know, looking at the pedestrian crossings, like Dale said, it's, it's roughly a 80% reduction in the number, you know, the actual, the longest crossing that a pedestrian would have to go across from 150 down to I think 32 was the longest crossing that anyone would have at one time. Um, you know, looking at the delay, we looked at the operations and then once again, the roundabout was superior um, to the traffic signal in that, in that regard. And then the traffic signal, just, it's kind of similar to other isolated signals that we have within our district on a corridor like this. I know it's similar to Red Wing on the north end where we have an isolated signal in a 55 mile an hour road and it, you're coming in from a rural area, there's a signal, there's some urban, um, you know, build up down by obviously all the, the development that's occurred out there. But then you get north of there and it's really, you know, you're surrounded by trees and a wider cross section and it, it really still does have that almost rural kind of suburban feel to it, which leads people to travel at higher speeds. Whereas the roundabout, um, again, the curves are forcing the drivers to slow down. Um, they, they physically would not be able to take these curves at a high rate of speed. We'd be down to 20 miles an hour. Um, we would be introducing curb and gutter on the approaches, which also is a, a, it's really a visual cue to the drivers to slow down as you're feeling like you're becoming more constrained. The, the, you know, the cross section would narrow up. You have curb on each side of you. Um, and then um, the other part is just on these, like on the median islands would be additional opportunities for landscaping which is um, just another visual cue to the driver to slow down. All right, go ahead. So in 2018, MnDOT did a study at, and current, at the time we had 126 roundabouts within the state. Um, there's actually quite a few more that have been constructed since that time. But um, they did a study as a our state traffic office. They had a researcher through the U of M looked at it and this is what the findings were. I think they're very interesting and uh, definitely worth note. So for a single lane, for any roundabout, this is both single and a multi-lane roundabout, there were, they found that there were 88% fewer pedestrian fatal and injury crashes when they compared them to all the, the similar signalized intersections. And that's after adjusting for the traffic volumes um, at those intersections. So it's, you know, it's not just the total number of crashes, but it's adjusted based on the volumes. And many of them were, there's kind of a, a good before and after case since they had previously been signals. Uh, bicycle safety was again superior. There's, it, it did vary a little more on that. It was 25 to 60%, but they were still fewer. Um, again, then looking at multi-lane roundabouts, there was a 70% lower crash rate and crash density for pedestrian crashes. And then pedestrians and bikes was about 50% lower in, as a result of that uh, study that was done. And I think the last thing I just wanted to note too, I think it's a, a worthwhile fact is since the advent of the modern roundabout since we since they've been constructed in the u.s there's been no pedestrian fatalities that have occurred at a crosswalk 
um, at, an, at a roundabout intersection in the US. So, and again, I think that speaks to both the, the speed control as well as the simplified crossing of a shorter crossing and um, only have to, to look at traffic coming from one direction. So we do realize that obviously this is a, a high speed intersection. People are coming into it. Um, there's, a high, there's high traffic volumes. We're aware of the, the truck volumes out there. So we, we really wanted to do everything we could to enhance these crossings to make them as safe as possible. And I met, I know personally, I met with um, our district traffic office and we, we consulted Federal Highway Administration, actually their safety officer talk to our state traffic office, um, some other roundabout experts around the state. I know we reached out to uh, some other city and county engineers that have been experienced in this area too. And really what came back recommended um, was to provide the retro reflective markings at all pedestrian crossings. So at each one of these, there'll be ones, there'll be, there'll be markings that'll be enhanced on the pavement, it'll be visible wet or dry, day or night, uh, they'll be reflective uh, back to the driver, really get them to stand out. The RFBs, this is another big thing that we wanted to be able to provide at all the multi-lane crossings. We recognize that those are having an increased, um, I guess, we really wanted to put additional focus on that just because I know it is a little more complicated to cross the multi-lanes. So by putting the rapid rectangular flashing beacons out there, um, they have been shown in other areas to provide a big benefit. I know in, uh, there was a federal highway study actually that was done a few years ago, showed that the, the yielding behavior of drivers approaching a crossing actually went up by 88% when an RRFB was installed um, at one of these crossings. And after they were installed, I believe every single one of them, um, it was up over 90% as far as the yielding behavior. Um, and then in some applications, these flashers are only put on the right side but we want to make sure that we do put them both on the left and the right side of the crossing um, for the multi-lane crossings. And then, like I said, I guess I already said that, but the flashers have been shown to increase yielding by up to the 88%. So this is just kind of a, a visual of what one of the crossings would look like on uh, Mankato or at 61 at any of the the multi-lanes. So you'd have the enhanced crossings, the pavement markings you can see on the, on the pavement. Um, there'd be the truncated domes. And then we would have the warning sign on each side of Highway 61 and then as on uh, right in the median as well, I guess. And then the, along with that, you, you can see right under the diamond sign, there's a little flasher and they flash at a high rate of speed to really Enhance, you know, enhance the visibility for drivers. So these would be pedestrian activated, that those flashers would trip once a pedestrian gets up to them. So I guess with that, I wanted to just maybe show a couple of videos. If, uh, Kevin, if you want to flip over to that. And we, we were able to reach out to some different people with uh, access to videos. Some of this our traffic office shot themselves. Um, I know I personally visited a couple of these sites and um, walked through them myself. So if you could just uh, cue up the video. This is just, a, I wanted to give a driver's view first. So this is approaching uh, one without a RFB in place. The driver travels through. Um, th this one just has multi-lane exit, but it again, it does not have the RRFB present. This one, 
again, you can see that it does have the RRFB. Um, I guess it kind of speaks to itself. Drives on through here. And maybe if you pause the video right here, I think one thing I really wanted to show about this one is this could be a, a, a corridor very similar to Mankato Avenue. It's a very similar, it's a similar speed limit. Um, you know, it just kind of shows some of the opportunities that were put in place here by, the, you know, some of the landscaping that was put in the median. You'll see up ahead there's landscaping in the boulevards. And all of this, what it really does, I mean, it, it obviously makes the corridor look a lot nicer, but it really also helps to control the speed of these roundabouts by, you know, creating that more urban feel. And I think there's opportunities for this, not only on Mankato Avenue, but on 61 as well, approaching the roundabouts. <coughs> so maybe just pay attention as you go along and just kind of try to, to envision in your head that this is Mankato Avenue. If you want to go ahead. And the one, one thing interesting up ahead here too, if you had be able to hit play there again. There's an intersection coming up that I thought was interesting to see. Um, it's It would be very similar to what uh, Parts and Brewski would be like, where it, it does allow a left turn lane off of the, the uh, off of Mankato Avenue, but it does not have a left turn coming off the side street. Now, are others seeing this video or am I not, am I the only one? You're the only one. So it is playing? No, no, no. Kevin, are you able to? There's one more, there's one more roundabout coming up I thought was also a interesting one to show and that would, it has very similar traffic volumes to the one at, at Mankato and Highway 61. I do want to show that one if we can, can get back to that. Maybe better just to uh, keep it playing then I guess this time. And this is uh, County State Highway uh, 53 actually in the Metro. But so here's that one intersection that I mentioned where it allows a left turn off of the main line but does not allow a left turn coming from the side street. And then this is the, the actual the last roundabout in this corridor of four roundabouts. Uh, again, very similar volumes on actually all the legs. Um, you can see just how they, you know, enter in the multi-lane. And just pay attention on the exit as you come around. There's actually a pedestrian that's that had triggered the RRFB here. And it was probably difficult to see at the time. But uh, um, it actually was going in. So here's just a, a view of some different pedestrian crossings that I wanted to show. And it's, it's just kind of interesting to see the yielding behavior of traffic. You can see they look one direction as you cross the road. Traffic stops in advance and then they go on their way. Um, here is a crossing with an RRFB. So the pedestrian goes up, the, the RRFB flashes, they go across, 
actual the traffic that stopped got cut off a little on the left, but you can see on the, the opposite side of the road where people are stopping to allow the pedestrian to go across. Here's another one with an aerial view. And probably something to pay attention to here is on the exit to this roundabout. You can see where how the, the crosswalks are set back. So it allows a vehicle to stop without actually plugging up the roundabout. So a pedestrian goes across, a vehicle stops to let them through. The roundabout still operates um, around the circulatory road and then the pedestrian goes on. Um, Again, here's just another view of that. You can see where they're crossing, multi-lane crossing. Um, and here, the thing I wanted to show here too, if you look at the people approaching the crosswalk, the people within the roundabout, as soon as they come around the corner, the curve of the roundabout, they're looking directly at that crossing so they're not, it's not going to be unexpected. They would be looking right at the pedestrian in the crosswalk. They can stop slow in advance. Um, and then you can see on the, the far side of the intersection, somebody stopped as well. So for bikes, very similar. They can cross if they're able to. Stop in the median. Look the opposite direction. Um, Again, here shows some vehicles stopped and they go on the, the rest of the way. And I think there's maybe one more bike that vehicles had already stopped to allow them to go across and then they continue on through. So with that, I don't know if you could pause there one minute, but were there any, I guess we can just show this too, as long as we're, we're here. So I just wanted to also show the truck movement. I don't know, were there any questions so far on what I've presented as far as the, some of the, the key points I made earlier or any of the videos? Council member Schultz. I have a question, I guess. I haven't had a lot of emails on this, but some of them that I've had have been from uh, truck drivers. Yep. And they, they don't like the idea, to say the least. You know, what kind of experience you have with the large semis navigating these uh, sorts of roundabouts. Yep, that's actually a, it's a good lead in to, maybe I can show here some of the accommodations that we've made. I know we've designed some other ones recently that a couple that I'm managing in a rural area and we've, you know, we've made sure to accommodate some of the really large loads that are going through in our rural communities when you get you know, the wind turbines and that type of thing. But I think you, I know you're, you're speaking more to the regular, um, you know, like a 53 foot delivery truck. So Kevin, if uh, we'll just show here. So, so here you can see if a truck is driving through the roundabout, they stay on the inside lane. They can continue right in that same lane without using both lanes. They would exit still staying in that inside lane, and then they could drive right on through. This is actually a higher speed roundabout. There's two of them actually on Highway 61, north of the Twin Cities. And um, again, I think two of the lanes are, or two of the legs are 50 miles an hour, two of the legs are 55. I just wanted to show a truck driving through them. And there is a couple points I know too. There's actually two schools that are east of the one. Um, there's a church and a couple, there's some neighborhoods in the area. So I do know that each one of them have three pedestrian crossings at them. So maybe Kevin, if you wanted to, to go back to the slides, show the truck moving. Hey, Chad. Yep. Before I forget, we should let everyone know that uh, those videos are posted to YouTube and they're not uh, as herky-jerky as what we just saw. So if anyone wanted to go look at those videos, they are posted. So here is, if you look at the, the kind of the pinkish purple 
lines, that's that would be the how a, a truck would drive to make a left turn. So you can see, um, you know, if they were they're they're approaching the roundabout, want to take a left turn, they would stay on that inside lane. They would drive around, stay on the inside lane. The uh, um, trailer would track over that maroonish area, which is the truck apron, which is what, how that's designed to accommodate those left turns, and then they would just continue on. If they're making a right turn, you can go to the next slide. So a right turn, if you look, you see the, like say for example, the bottom of the page, taking a right to go to the right, um, they would approach on the outside lane, they would stay, they would still just stay in that one lane the one vehicle could stay right alongside of them. Uh, um, you know, sometimes truckers, we have heard they, they'll straddle both lanes. And I think definitely the way they're designed and what, what's recommended internationally is if they're driving straight through, they would straddle both lanes and then they would continue on. And that's, that's really to prevent that tracking so the trailers aren't tracking over a a car that would get in their blind spot. So, so truckers, um, that's how they would drive that right down the middle. And our traffic model does account for that. So that is how they've been designed and that's how it's recommended nationally. But I do know that, you know, I've been involved in several roundabout projects myself and we're, you know, we're getting more, more of them around the district. And really, we have not had issues with, with trucks getting through any of them. They're actually, they're pretty smooth when a truck, you know, when a truck goes through it, it's, it's really not that complex for them to travel. As you can see kind of by that, a couple of videos as they, you know, they went around pretty easily. Me or George here? Go ahead, George. Yeah, just uh, in regards to uh, with Chad there, as far as the trucks go, I think a lot of that as well too, Chad and everyone else is that uh, the experience of the truck driver too. That you know, have they been through those before? And I'm sure probably the first time a, a truck driver is going to go through there, they may be a little intimidated by it. But I think as their experience goes, and there's a lot of experienced drivers out there. As non-experienced drivers, they uh, accommodate those turns and corners very, very well. Council Member Schoenmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, Chad or Kevin, Dale, whomever. I'm wondering, so what happens when a truck and a car come into the roundabout at the same time? And, um, you know, this is what I've heard from some truck drivers about uh, you just mentioned that the the trucks take you know take the the straddle the lanes, and so what's going to happen then with that car that was just to the right of that uh, truck? Does he basically get pushed out of the way? What happens? You know, it, it's similar to how we design a lot of other intersect like at a standard intersection when we have a right turn lane. Truckers always have an issue with people trying, you know, they, when they take a right turn, they typically turn from the through lane, not the right turn lane. So truckers, I know it's very common. They have trouble with people getting around on the right side of them because people, you know, cars naturally, some drivers cheat around and they try to get alongside them. So, you know, I, how these would operate is that it's, it's similar to when you're coming into a merge, the, the truck would, you know, they would have to merge over and they, they would straddle that lane um, as they're approaching it. But I think the, one of the bigger things is if they're taking a left turn, that car can stay right next to them. So they, they can stay totally, they can make that turn, stay in the inside lane, the trailer will track over the roundabout and they do not even conflict. For the right turns, um, you know, in, in general, um, some of them are gonna, you know, 
if if they're able to, some of them probably will still straddle the two lanes, but um, for certain movements, they can still stay within their, their single lane anyways, depending on the size of the vehicle. Um, but it's just those through traffic, the through traffic that they'll have that where they have to straddle the lanes, so. Yeah, and so I see that as a, as a potential conflict because uh, it looks like we have a single lane uh, coming out of the roundabout, whereas we have uh, two going in. And then I have a, a, a question re related to cycling. Um, are cyclists now expected to be on the path and then they, they have to actually, um, they're restricted to the pedestrian type crossing. So they can't move with traffic anymore. They have to move as a pedestrian. Is that correct? So, you know, we really see both and depends on the experience of the biker. And if they're, you know, if they're comfort, comfortable, a lot of bikers yeah. that, you know, if somebody's following the Highway 61 for a long distance and they're riding on the shoulder, they're probably a more experienced biker. And as, you know, they're really given the choice. So when they come up to a roundabout, you know, if the speeds are operating at 20, 15 to 20 miles an hour, or even 25, a bike, an experienced biker could easily stay in the lane if they so choose. But, you know, probably the majority of, of bikers, that trail really ties into the, to the shoulder of Highway 61. It's kind of cut off the, on the bottom of the screen, but if you're imagining you're going north on 61 from the bottom of the page to the top, that you, you, if you're riding on that 10 foot shoulder, you would stay there, you could exit onto that tan, um, shared 10 foot bike trail, take that. You would cross the lanes just like a pedestrian and then you can continue on and it, t it ties into the shoulder again to the north. So it, it really depends on the experience of the biker, but they do really have two options for that. Okay, so the, thank you. So it, it's not expected that the cyclist would be taking the path. If, if you're an experienced cyclist, I am. Um, I could stay in the traffic lane and the cyclist can take and stay in the traffic lane. That's, that's yep. correct statement, okay. And it's similar to Mankato if there's if you know if if the bikers are really comfortable riding out there, there's really nothing that prevents someone out there today from riding it, riding on Mankato or even in the future. But you know the majority of people are probably going to take the trail just because it's there's that added level of safety for them. So, but yeah, yep. Say, so, Mayor, I have a question. This is Pam. Go ahead, Pam. Yes. Hi. Okay, I'm, I'm really interested to see all of the many safety, um, safety considerations that have been added here, and, and this is very good. Uh, the RRFBs, um, Chad, are we planning to put those in at the other intersections as well, or are we just putting them in at 61 in Mankato? Our traffic office, we started with um, Highway 61 and you know, the, the issues there, and we really wanted to make sure we, those were um, addressed first. And so it kind of, it really started there, but the more we met with different people and reached, saw, um, I guess they consulted experts, it really, um, it really showed a benefit. So they're really recommending at the multi-lanes project. <coughs> so it would be at Riverbend, Frontenac, and then I think there's one multi-lane crossing at Sarnia as well, one or two. So, yeah, it'd be okay. for all four of them. Okay, that's that's really good to hear. Uh, I, in the law, Chad, are drivers required to yield to pedestrians? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, even if, even in roundabouts, they are required yep. to do that, right? Correct. It is treated just like any other intersection or a a marked crossing where drivers are legally required to stop. Okay. So I think, I think a big piece of this is being very cognizant of where we are placing signs, where we're placing land, where we're 
um, putting in landscaping, just so we really enhance the visibility of when you're approaching these roundabouts, so the, where that pedestrian is sitting, making them very visible. So, you know, kind of like the, the one video showed, right, as you come around the circular roadway in the middle of the roundabout, you want to be looking right at that pedestrian sitting in the crossing um, and then not obstructed by, you know, any landscaping or signs. So that's something that we'll definitely be mindful of as we get, you know, further into the project. Thank you. Two questions. Will the roundabouts have uh, plantings in them or colored concrete? elevated so the the center of the roundabouts will have a l they'll be mounted up so it's again it's it's that visual cue for a driver that something is coming up they need to slow down for um we're actually going to be we've been working with uh i believe it's chad Uwell that's helping us get a visual quality advisory committee set up so We'll be looking at landscaping and aesthetics for really all of Mankato, which will include the Highway 61 intersection. So they'll make they'll make recommendations for what really is like what type of plantings would be in the middle, what type of plantings do people want to see within the median. Um, but again, you know, maintenance is always a big issue with that too. So um, you know, that's something that we'll have to be concerned with and. You know, in the end, it's really the city council that would, we would ask to adopt that to make sure that you guys are all right with the final aesthetics and landscaping that are included. But and generally, yeah, they would be mounted up in some type of landscaping, whether it's just, you know, a low maintenance grass or if there's there's shrubbery or whatever you guys would like to see out there. Do you know why that wasn't done over there across from IV? I guess I do not know. I'm sorry, I wasn't involved in that one, but. Um, I've got a wife that's, I, I can hardly hold her back from taking a brush and a can of paint over there to paint that roundabout. Yeah, yeah, I guess I've, I, I couldn't answer that one, but right. we definitely, this, you know, for a, for a larger project like this, that would definitely be something we'll look at. Uh, Mayor Al, with a few questions, if you can hear me. Thank you. Hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'll try to ask all my questions now. Uh, um, as far as the art, the flashing beacons for pedestrians, is that timed to the pedestrian's pace, or are they timed just at a set rate? We time them based on the, the speeds that Dale mentioned. So there's there's guidance from Fed the Federal Highway Administration for once you hit that button, what it takes for a um, for an older pedestrian to cross that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it would be simply they hit the they hit that button, wait for the vehicles to to come to a stop, and then they would go across. Similar to like a traffic signal, how it's how it's timed based on the distance they have to cross. So it's not sensitive to to, to motion at all, but it's it's timed and they remain on if somebody is riding a bike and gets across there a little faster. Correct. It so, would stay on. And that's not all that bad because it says, hey, there might be something up here for drivers ahead of them. So that's a good idea. What but, about um, in general, uh, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the turn at, at Brewski and Parks Avenue, uh, you don't have to go to the slide or anything. I'll just ask the question because you can you can make a traffic movement. Are you anticipating people who will make a complete U-turn into there, like a J-turn? Um, are you referring to if you're coming off of Parks and Brewski, if you're on Mankato? Um, say if you're on Mankato, and, so and if you're on you want Mankato, to turn into Brewski or Parks. If you want to, if you're on Mankato and you want to turn into Parks or Brewski, you would you would take a left turn directly on to right. Parks and Brewski. But if you're on, if you're on uh, Parks and Brewski and want to take a left, we how that would work would be they would take a right. They would go down to the roundabout either at Highway 61 if you're on Parks and then go around and then you you know you can go back the other direction. If you're so on you, Brewski and you want to head towards 61, you would just take a right, go around the roundabout at Riverbend and then you'd head back to 61. 
let's say you wanted to take a shortcut if you're traveling south on Mankato at Brewski and you notice there's a way to turn, I mean, uh, at, uh, you know, toward Brewski, but then complete a U-turn and head back north on Mankato. Do you anticipate drivers doing that? No, I, I really don't see why, why someone would need to do that. Um, you know, really the people who would be making that move, I think are a lot of the, the businesses over in that area, like, you know, like uh, Severson's and people going to the fleet farm. Um, I think there's the hotel over there, but really the only, the business access between Parks and Brewski and Riverbend is that the subway property and they would have access right off of Brewski. So they could turn in, take a left down to Brewski, and then they could yeah. go on the driveway right there. Understandable. So. Uh, question, how does traffic in general, this will be my last question, uh, how does traffic at uh, Mankato 61 with uh, your proposed signalized intersection with the additional turning lanes, how does the volume of traffic at those intersections compare in a standard signalized intersection with what you're proposing in, in a, a, the, a, the roundabout fashion? Um, I guess, could you say that maybe, so you're wondering how the volumes would compare between the two? Yes, how much traffic could one have and what would be the constraints um, to reduce the volume if, if, if for some reason um, our traffic volume increases, um, you know, does, does this allow a, a smoother, faster flow uh, in terms of traffic numbers that get through the intersection compared to the standard lighted or signalized intersection? Yeah, sure. So basically the, when we look at, at the designing these intersections, we, we designed the roundabout based on a projection 10 years into the future. Um, so we, we want to not overbuild these to add too many lanes because the more lanes you add, the more conflict there is. And it just, you know, it makes more long, longer crossing for pedestrians. Um, so we try to really, keep, you know, only provide the, the absolute number that we would need at the, at the, within the 10 year time frame. But we also look out 20 years and to see to make sure that we would be able to accommodate that if traffic would grow faster than we would anticipate. So the, the roundabout is actually designed. So on the, like say for example, on northbound and southbound on Mankato, um, right in there, the, the median is, it's designed so it could easily be, it, to put it simply, you, we would shave that median off right there and it's accommod it would be designed to accommodate a second lane, both northbound and southbound. Um, but both on day of opening and looking at our traffic projections, the roundabout would be able to handle a far greater volume of traffic compared to the signal with less delay. So we have made accommodations though, if that volume would increase more. Um, what, <laughs> The one other thing I think is worth noting too is MnDOT, we frequently do this. We base our design on 10 years, but we try to make accommodations for a future growth that, you know, is, is out there a ways. And I don't believe that there's any roundabouts in Min Minnesota right now that have been expanded on the state highway system. So we, we seem to think that they're going to get overloaded, but yet it's actually gone the other way. There's more that have been reduced in lanes. We've went back and tried to, to shrink them down a little bit more um, just to help out with the safety, so. Okay, but, Thank, thanks again for your answer, Chad. Yep, and I, I just wanna just make sure it's clear too. This is a snapshot. We look at the worst time of the day. We look at the AM and the PM peak hour volumes, so over 90% of the time, the roundabout is gonna function better than even what our traffic model shows. Um, you know, we take, we take one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon, and that's what we base everything on. 
and so it's a snapshot in time and then beyond that we even look at the, the worst 15 minutes of that one hour so that's really what we're designing these based on so you know we are confident that these are going to be able to hand with it stand this this volume of traffic that we have out there thanks again mayor george here uh, george uh now chad by looking at this uh there are no direct bypass lanes at all correct correct we have and removed the one northbound to go south on 61 but we'll preserve that right of way so if there are any you know, if that volume would increase significantly in the future, we could always add that back in. But we really wanted to remove that. It's, it's really not necessary from a volume standpoint. And by having that in there, that's just one additional conflict for that free right bypass crossing that 10 foot trail. So we feel it's a lot safer to bring all those people right up to the roundabout and not have to cross that 10 foot trail in the southeast corner. Um, and really that, that volume making that move is pretty low. So we're, you know, it'll work fine without that. Okay, now the markings now I've seen on the pavement where they had the arrows and going straight, making a left. Is there going to be anything hanging overhead at all? Yeah, that's another thing on that uh, our state signing office has recommended that we have overhead signing in advance of these. And, and that's, again, it's another visual cue for the driver to slow down, something's coming up, but it's also very important on a multi-lane so traffic knows what lane they need to be in. So we wanna get them well in advance of the roundabout, we would put in those the overhead signage. So we have, we have planned for that. Okay, and then also as as you move forward on this and and beginning to close in plans and providing that uh, the health situation kind of clears up, uh, you will have another meeting plan like out at the armory or city hall or somewhere where the general public can come and look at this again. Yep. Yeah, we will definitely have another outreach uh, for the public in the future on this one as we get a little bit further along. And I think a big part of that next meeting will really be focused on construction. And, you know, we'll, it'll be a review of the layout. And we also wanna really, we have some different education materials we can put out there. So it's, so, you know, people are getting more comfortable with driving these things and just know what's, what's coming and what to be expected. So. We do have some different educational things we would show at that that meeting as well. But a big part of that would be is just so the businesses and the residents and everybody along the corridor can plan how they're going to have, you know, so they're not, they're not surprised when construction starts, how people are going to be able to get to their business. Um, Steve has a question you'd like to ask. Hey, hey Chad, if you're, if you're at a quick trip and you want to head south on 43 you take a right go around the roundabout correct if you're at quick trip and want it so if you're quick trip in the southeast there and you want to go where oh yeah, yes south exactly. on 43. correct you would okay. go right on or the other uh, most likely what people would do is they would just take and go out the driveway on sugarloaf field directly and then they could just take a left turn at that intersection well, there's all these, there's all these um, parking lots and everything that kind of all jammed together back there. There's no clear way of getting around. Not now. If you're at, if you're at the hotel Motel Eight, on the other side of that intersection, and you want to go into town, how do, how do you do that? If you're so, down there and you want to go into town on Mankato. No, you're. You're across the road. The other, the other side of the road for Quick Trip. Yep. And so you want to go into the city. So right there's Motel, Super 8. Yep. I want to go from Super 8 and I got a meeting downtown. How do, I, how do I do that? So the people you're saying coming off of like East 
East uh, East, Lake. East Lake Boulevard, they would they would have to, you know, they could either come off and they could take a left turn. Um, you know, they would either have to go to the north along 61, or they would have to come down here, and then they would they would have to make that U turn there. Or they could, you know, come in to, to so quit their barrier turn and there? make a turn like that. So you can make a U turn right there. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm hoping we can address some of these, like how you get back to Fleet Farm and um, uh, the restaurant there, Perkins, and then that whole area around Quick Trip. Have we been talking to Quick Trip or the? Is there yeah, do we been that way? I do think that I do think that it, it you know it is going to change quite a bit when Quick Trip redevelops that we we have met with Quick Trip and we've been discussing it with them as well. Okay, so just it's, to make sure their site development plan works. Yeah, with it's it. it's just critical that we have those discussions. Hey, that whole Sugarloaf view, that whole road back there. It's hopefully this makes it easier for people to be able to go. And I know the direction they're on forty three. And I know they were supportive of this option, so that was good to hear at least. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, you. I, we should also mention that we're planning to meet with Monona Health to look at the construction staging to make sure that uh, any impacts to their operations are absolutely minimized as much as possible. Right, especially the ambulance access yes. to the emergency room. Yep. Mark, Michelle, Alexander. Go ahead, Michelle. So um, I've heard from quite a few people and most of them are fine with the project. Their biggest concern, of course, is that intersection at Highway 61 and 43. And I think to your point, some of this is gonna be education and just doing it um, and realizing how it functions. But now I'm, I'm gonna ask a question about that U-turn. Is it because you're closing down some of the accesses to those buildings over there, like um, Super 8, that you think that U-turn is going to be a better solution? Because right now, the traffic coming off of um, Sugarloaf onto the 43 is quite hairy with all the cars coming from, you know, down north and the cars coming south off of the highway. Is, is that you're thinking that'll be a safe maneuver for the vehicles coming off of Sugarloaf Road there, a U-turn? I think the the environment is going to change a lot out here when that roundabout gets installed. the The speeds are going to be completely changed compared to what's what's happening out there today. You know, people and I, can go through the sixty one intersection a lot faster. So, by and, you know, the, the people coming through the roundabout will be going slower. So that's where people are pulling out. It should be quite a bit easier. And am I looking at this correctly? That red is an extension of the median, which means they can't come directly across. They have to make the turn and then do a U-turn. So then maybe their entrance into is one-way traffic instead of two-way. Am I reading that correctly? Correct, it is. And okay. Again, that's just because of the proximity to proximity to the intersection. We've just we felt that was really needed from a safety standpoint. And I guess oh, the other reason people think, or the other thing people could do is they could come off and if they weren't comfortable with that left turn or to make the u-turn they could take a left in and i guess they would they would have to go into the quick trip and then they could exit out their drive and the sugarloaf road people can still go down to huff street depending on where they're going downtown so all of their access isn't closed anyway it's just going to be a little bit of an adjustment basically at that intersection sure Okay, and so at this public meeting, you'll go over some of these details with the public about shorter distances and shorter wait times and kind of how you envision trucks and cars navigating it together. So I think, I think George brought that up, but I think that is the biggest concern that I've heard from the community is people are concerned about what happens when they hit that intersection. Um, not so much the other ones, because um, they're smaller. <laughs> But this one in particular, I think, is worrisome for um, some of the drivers. They've actually asked if we could have police direct traffic, but I'm not sure that's functional. <laughs> I don't think that would, I'm not sure that would help. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, we, we, we definitely would do that. I mean, we can go over much of what we went over tonight just to show a lot of these same things to drivers. Um, again, it's, it's the education piece. It's people just getting used to it. It's going to be a change traffic pattern. But I mean, we're, we're just as concerned about safety out here as, as the next person. So we're not going to, we would not build these if we did not feel they were safe or if they could, they could operate um, with this volume of traffic. So, you know, we, I mean, we simply would not do that. So it, it will be the education though, but we definitely can do that at the next meeting. Other questions? We're getting near the near the end of our time here. Uh, Chad, can you address the common question that comes up of why four roundabouts? Can't we do a signals in the middle or one of the three, you know, be eliminated? One of the four be eliminated? Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Brian. Um, I think that the one thing that really needs to be clear is really these things operate as a system. And that's really where they get their biggest benefit is just the, the consistency and speeds throughout the corridor. It, it creates a, you know, it's kind of that, that expectancy from a, for a pedestrian. They know what trap, what speed traffic is going to be going when they cross the, the, the pedestrian crossing. And, and it's, it's not only from a pedestrian crossing having a consistent speed, but it's also traffic. When you have a signal within a roundabout, um, you know, you're having your platooning. If you have a signal released, all of a sudden they're all gonna get released at this, at one time and you have a long queue of traffic gets released, they hit the roundabout and then they're kind of metered almost as they go into the roundabout. So it, really the, the biggest benefit for operational is just be able to have that cor corridor consistency um, Chad, yep. and, and to add on to that, that study that was done in Golden, Colorado on a corridor that was similar than this, uh, putting them together as a system, the four roundabouts, their results were that people made it through the corridor more quickly, even though the speeds in the corridor were reduced. So that uh, plays to the benefit of a series of roundabouts as well. Any further final questions? Thank you gentlemen for very much for coming back to the council and sharing uh, some additional information and giving us an opportunity to answer questions or ask questions. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for allowing us. So appreciate it. Thank you folks. Uh, we'll start again in five minutes or whenever Al tells us. <laughs> Meeting to order, we'll stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I've got a... Uh, script I need to read here at 6.30 and I've called the meeting to order. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Winona City Council and is being held via conference call pursuant to Minnesota Statutes 13D.021 in response to the COVID-19 emergency. Let me remind those who are on the conference call line, please mute your phones until you're asked to speak. Also, please identify yourself before you speak. As required by the statute, all votes will be conducted by roll call, so each member's vote on each issue can be identified and recorded. Also, if any time a council member is not able to hear the discussion or one another, please interrupt me immediately to indicate so. Also, just a reminder to state your name before you speak so that you're easily identified. Uh, I have a few, just a couple of items here I'd like to uh, uh, bring up. Uh, one is uh, I want to thank uh, Brian Verdi for his uh, efforts over the funny. past. That's not um, funny. He doesn't have any like radio Somebody needs to mute their mic. Okay. I'd like to thank uh, Brian Verdi for his efforts over the last week and the 
We're one for Winona campaign. I think it's been uh, very successful. We've had hundreds of responses uh, from individuals, uh, 30 businesses have taken the mask wearing selfies and shared them across social media and uh, along with the reasons why they're wearing a mask. Uh, there's lots of lots and lots of good reasons for wearing a mask. Earlier this afternoon, I asked the city manager to send out a, uh, a draft of an emergency declaration, which I would like the council to consider. Uh, we have uh, uh, been asked by many people to require people to wear masks in public, and we have not done that so far, mostly because uh, we haven't seen the spiking that uh, uh, we thought was necessary. We've also been anticipating that possibly the governor would uh, uh, require that statewide. He hasn't done that so far. And uh, the, the campaign of where one for Winona, we wanted to uh, uh, see how effective that can be. We've learned that the city of Rochester, effective this Wednesday, is going to uh, start requiring uh, city masks be worn in public by everyone. And uh, we've also seen a spike in uh, cases in Trempolo, uh, on Alaska, uh, La Crosse, and uh, this is very concerning for us here in Winona as well. Now we have a draft of an of a emergency uh, declaration requiring people to wear them, and I'm curious uh, what the response might be of the support for such a, an effort um, by other council members. Um, there's several options I think that we have here. One, um, I can just declare it if I want uh, for up to 30 days. Um, we could have the council uh, weigh in and, and support such a motion and uh, let the mayor make that, along with the staff, make that uh, decision about when that would start. Um, we could wait two weeks if necessary uh, for a for this to be on the agenda for the council to consider it. Uh, so we have options, uh, but we also have serious concerns here in this community about uh, how this uh, uh, COVID-19 is spreading. Uh, there's several cases a day. Um, we haven't seen any more deaths, but we certainly are seeing a, a huge, a, a big increase regionally. And uh, um, I think there's some power in working together with our neighbors to uh, um, try to uh, beat this down. So I'm curious at this point if there's any comments from other council members on how they might uh, feel about this. Mark, Michelle, Alexander, I did not receive that um, memo. Okay. It was Probably. sent out, uh, you know, maybe four o'clock late I earlier look at, this afternoon. I look so. at my email now and it's not there. Okay. So, I mean, I would want to read it and I have so many questions after, I mean, after I read it, maybe some of them are answered in there. I'm not okay. sure. All right. Uh, Councilman Thurley here. Yep, Al. Um, you know, I concur with uh, Council Person Alexander that I did receive it though. I did look it over, but again, it's one of those things that um, it's, it's necessary health wise, but I'd like us to at least have a discussion. I know I've received emails and I don't know if uh, other council members have well have received uh, emails from people who um, are concerned about this. I, I don't particularly agree with the with their perspective, but they certainly uh, have have uh, uh, perhaps everything uh, to uh, be a part of that discussion. So, but I, I think I would like to see us just um, you know catch our breath a little bit, have a chance to read it over, and then uh, perhaps. Um, uh, vote on it accordingly after the public has gotten a chance to uh, give their input. I'm sure it'll be overwhelmingly in favor. That's what I do when I go out. But again, um, uh, this is another way that we can uh, keep people in Winona healthy by, by doing this the right way. If we do it the wrong way, I don't think we'll get as much cooperation. Thank you. Council Member Schoenmeyer. Paul? Uh, I had a look at the memo and, and I would certainly uh, support um, you know, such resolution. My concern about waiting, it, it's not on the agenda tonight, and my concern about 
uh, waiting to vote on it as a council is here, then we'll be waiting two more weeks. And I've been getting uh, plenty of uh, constituent feedback about issues uh, in the public, in particular some of the, the public uh, facilities that require um, constituents to go to, to get licenses um, and other things. And, and I know uh, we don't run the county operations, but certainly uh, there's been a lot of concern um, that I've heard about people going into uh, to get uh, tabs or other things and, and not feeling uh, that they're being protected. Me here, George here. Oh, sorry. Hello, George. Yeah, uh, I did not see that memo as, uh, as of yet. I would like to look at it as well, too. I know I've had uh, some emails and phone calls on it and messages saying that, you know, people are not in favor of this. I hear some from, from people that are in favor of it. Uh, some young people told me that, you know, I think everyone Onan knows right from wrong. And, uh, you know, if, if, it, if they feel they should be wearing it, they will wear it. And then again, if you have that authority to go ahead and declare that, which I say, you know, we probably won't do, do nothing on this tonight because it's not an agenda item. Uh, if you feel it's getting worse and you have the, uh, the authority to go ahead and, uh, and put it in, uh, you know, well, you know, that's your call. And of course, the big question is, is how do we enforce it? So, um, Eileen Moeller here. Uh, I, I was able to look at the draft and um, while I personally am supportive of everyone wearing a mask in public, I, I agree with George that I think that I, I question the, um, I question uh, whether or not it is useful to us to um, make a declaration like that when we can't actually enforce it, or if our time would be better spent um, working with individual businesses, perhaps places where people are gathering and going in and out. Um, because if we're asking people to wear masks in public, and that includes parks and sidewalks and things like that, um, I just don't think that, I just don't think there's any point to that because I, I don't think enough people will follow through on it. And so many of the times people are out in open spaces. Um, you know, I hope that people care enough about their fellow community members that they would um, do the right thing uh, since it is not just about whether or not an individual feels sick, but whether they could unconsciously transmit it to someone else. But um, if, if we have no intention or way to really enforce um, individuals wearing masks while they're just going about their day-to-day -day lives, then I'm not certain if, I, if, if there's a point in doing that. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, that's all I had for tonight. And I'll ask the city manager if he has anything. Uh, thank you, Honor. Just wanted to thank folks who participated and organized in the listening circle at Unity Park, which was held uh, June 22nd. It was a very inspiring event. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll ask the city clerk to take the roll call and the members of the city council or, uh, please indicate your presence by stating here as the city clerk calls your name. Mayor Peterson. Here. Councilman Thurley. Here. Moeller. Here. Alexander. Here. Aiden. Here. Gorshikowski. Here. Schollmeyer. Here. All right. We're going to be having a one public hearing tonight and uh, the public hearing staff is going to make a short presentation. And then I'm going to ask if anybody from the public wishes to speak to the matter. You must, if you do, you must clearly state your name and address and you'll be given up to three minutes to make your testimony. I'll call three times for public comments. Uh, once the hearing's closed, the public may not participate in any of the discussion by the city council. And council, if you wish to make a motion, state the following, your name, move to approve, uh, and then to, and, uh, to second to the motion, your name again, and 
uh, seconding the motion. So uh, we'll start with the uh, item one or two. Item 2.1 2. 2. is 22839 County Road 17 Comprehensive Plan Amendment Request to change from low density to urban residential. This is a public hearing. I would note we have three written comments that were submitted to the council and were forwarded to council. Uh, one from Jerry Pappenfuss, the second one from Sterling Heath, and the third one from Sandy Shirk Heath. And those comments will become part of the public record as well as the ones that were included in the packet. I'll declare the public hearing open, and I'd like to call on uh, Lucy McMartin to uh, open it up. Thank you, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, City Planner uh, Carlos Espinosa will take this on, but I wanted to give a community and economic development perspective on this project. Um, as you know, our comprehensive plan is getting quite old, and we're seeing more and more amendments that do come forward. Um, I do want to note that uh, we began working with Bradford Development over a year ago, well over a year ago, and that we looked at over 12 sites, probably 15 sites throughout the city as they were looking for land to develop and expand uh, from their Willowbrook, their existing co-op development. This particular parcel is not only in the urban expansion area in the comp plan, but it's also in the former orderly annexation agreement area and in the current orderly annexation agreement area. Now there's many steps to development and this is one of, I believe, eight or 10 steps that have to move forward. But oftentimes when we're reviewing comp plan amendments, it is natural to want to know what that development looks like. So after not being successful with a four story building, this developer, Bradford Development, came back to the table and offered to make a three story instead of a four story building. This is an $11 million project. It'll produce approximately $60,000 a year in taxes. And it is uh, supported in the housing needs assessment and the mayor's task force on housing. Also, we have a very short supply, one of the shortest in Southern Minnesota of for sale housing. And this particular development could free up some of that market. So with those comments uh, about the economic side of the project, I'll pass it on to um, Carlos. Evening, Mayor and Council. I'm going to share my screen. As Lucy noted, the updated request again relates to approximately three acres of land at 22839 County Road 17. However, as Lucy also noted for this uh, application, the developer is proposing up to 36 units for a senior co-op and a building height of three stories instead of four. This reduction in overall height brings the building uh, closer in height to the existing Winona Arms building in Knott Valley that you see in this picture, as well as the existing Willowbrook building off of Burns Valley Road uh, in the city of Winona. Again, Bradford is requesting a comprehensive plan amendment change for the land use designation from low density to urban residential to facilitate the project. Although urban residential is a misnomer for the property at 22839 County Road 17, this is the only comprehensive land, plan, land use designation that would support the project. On May 26th, the Planning Commission discussed this urban residential designation and there was general consensus among commissioners that when the comprehensive plan is updated, which is currently planned in 2021 and 2022, a new land use designation should be discussed that would facilitate suburban multifamily projects such as this. If approved, construction of the co-op would still be subject to many additional approvals, as Lucy mentioned, including uh, annexation, application of zoning, preliminary final plats, and site plan review as well. 
On June 8th, the Planning Commission had a split vote four to four on the updated request. And draft minutes of that meeting are included as part of Council's packet for tonight. Should Council support the request, staff would recommend adding two conditions. Number one, all land use, zoning, subdivision, and site plan approvals to construct the three-story co-op senior living facility with up to 36 units shall be obtained by June 2021. And then number two, if the condition number one is not met, the comprehensive plan change shall be null and void. So if the approvals don't go through uh, for the rest of the project, uh, the land use designation re revert back to low density. So options for council tonight, the first would be to approve the request and recommended conditions with a motion to introduce the resolution in your packets for approval. In this case, because it is a comprehensive plan amendment, a super majority vote, a super majority of five votes is required. You could also deny the request or table the request if more information is needed. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Does anybody wish to speak to this uh, issue? Hi, this is Melissa Nelson with Bradford Development, 501 North Riverfront Drive, Mankato, 56001. We are the sponsor of senior housing cooperatives. We work with HUD um, and we are looking to bring Cedar Brook to Winona. I just wanted to touch on when we are talking up to 36 units. Um, we said that just to give a little bit of flexibility in the design if we'd like to split a unit or two if people are interested in smaller units, but the footprint of our current building and design is really set for a 28 unit building. Um, so I just wanted to make that note. A um, couple other items, just why we chose this parcel. I know there's been a lot of discussion on that. And um, one is the affordability of it, being able to bring new construction. Um, it all starts with affordability and, and that parcel is it. Um, we have found that the target market really desires this type of setting, a more quiet, peaceful area. Um, I've read in a number of studies that County Road 17 was deemed an area of future growth because the utilities are right there near the site and um, it's close enough in proximity to the retail and health care and golf course. Um, it is really just an ideal site for a senior housing cooperative and they're, it's a fantastic concept. They're good neighbors. They're well-respected properties for years and years into the future because they're HUD-insured buildings. Um, so I can't say enough about how wonderful of a multifamily building uh, they really are. Um, just one other thing, we've got a lot of po positive feedback, you know, on the cooperative concept itself, as well as the location. Um, the reservation list is still exceeding the number of units that we would be building, knowing that that was the potential site for Cedar Brook, which brought a lot of people um, in. And I just think it's a great opportunity for Winona to help fill that demand for both the seniors and single family home ownership that it'll open up uh, for folks looking for single family homes. So I just wanted to thank you guys again for your time. And I am here if anybody has any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak? I would. Okay, go ahead. Francis Edstrom. Am I supposed to give my address? Yes. Okay, 23089 Blackberry Road. And, um, I, you know, I find it interesting that <clears throat> the developers uh, chose this site because it was peaceful and quiet. And uh, adding, you know, another potentially 46 cars or 56 cars uh, to Highway 17 is not going to make it peaceful and quiet. And, uh, you know, being right across the street from uh, an event center uh, is, I think, going to put way too much traffic on 17 and uh, we'll lose, you know, what is one of the attractive things about living uh, around uh, Winona. And that is quiet and peaceful valleys that we can go to. That's it. Thank you. Others who wish to speak, go ahead. Anybody? 
Anybody else wish to speak? Hi, this is Laurel Latrell, 23273 Blackberry Road. We're on. Okay, go ahead. Great, thank you. I hope my um, comments were included in the packet. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, my feeling on the subject hasn't changed. Those of us that moved to this area moved here because it's peaceful and there aren't high rises. And uh, as I stated before, if I wanted to live by the Winona Arms building, I would have moved to Knopp Valley, not to Pleasant Valley and Wilson Township. Um, you know, this is Wilson Township property. I, I think its fate should be determined by Wilson Township, not Winona. And the fact that it's HUD, I appreciate that, but it makes me feel like I have even more of a stake in it because they're my tax dollars paying for it. And, you know, who is there? I guess I have a question about that. Is somebody determining that, you know, the seniors who are on the list are in need of affordable housing or are they simply, you know, well-connected people who happen to know the developers and people on the whatever planning committee and just sort of got a back door in because I keep hearing, oh, the list filled right up and we didn't even have to advertise. So are these just, you know, affluent Winonans who want to live across from the golf course and get a great deal or are these really seniors that are in need of affordable housing. I guess that's a question I have and my comments all still stand. And uh, I'd like to say something, Sorry. Mike Luttrell, 23273 Black Ray Road. Uh, Michelle Alexander had mentioned that <clears throat> the people living closest to this development were um, in favor of that. And I've talked to um, the terraces, they're not in favor of this. And um, I'm pretty. Right. I don't think we should. I mean, those people should speak for themselves. Others shouldn't speak for them. I guess, including us. But um, that would include people on the city council. You know, those people should be speaking up. I think some of them are afraid to, um, but we can't speak for them, and nobody else should either. Right. And then the safety factor. Um, I feel like I've I've seen the. Um, or I, I was going to ask if anybody had talked about the surveys that have been done by MnDOT for the uh, amount of traffic that's on 17 and also um, living here. If I'm going the speed limit, somebody's rear-ending me, or not rear-ending me, but riding me when I'm turning off on Blackberry. And I've seen several um, county, um, uh, Winona County uh, sheriffs pulling people over for speeding. And then also there's been a number of accidents and um, deer hit and I'm just worried about like the fact that if we get people if there's no sidewalks you know people walking you know could end up the same way that deer do. We're increasing the traffic on the road we're increasing people on the shoulders there are no sidewalks available you know again this doesn't fit the definition of uh, the higher density urban residential without sidewalks, connection to city parks. There are no open spaces. The only open spaces around it are covered with piles of trees and debris and brush. And I just don't see how it fits this land designation and how it can anywhere in the near future. Okay, well, thank you for your comments. Anybody else wish to speak? Yes, this is Roberta Booman, 25118 County Road 17. And uh, I'd like to first of all say, I think this is a great project. I think this type of housing is um, really um, something that is um, desired and needed for senior living. And I'm hoping it's based on maybe market analysis of the Winona City community to, to show that it is needed. However, I, I think the location is a concern. Um, I think the location, a couple of things have been brought up. First of all, the developments that we have out here in Pleasant Valley, um, Meadowbrook, Cobblestone, um, Valley View Estates are residential um, housing, but not a uh, more, more um, dense or high rise type housing. And I guess if the developer or this property were to be developed, I'd like to see it developed more as a 
you know, the single family residential housing as we have in the other housing developments throughout Pleasant Valley. Um, the second thing is the, the traffic. This is right at the um, beginning of the valley, right after the roundabout, and then people would be turning off into um, the development area. I think that traffic is a concern. This is a, a two lane road. Um, it's, it's not well, um, I mean, it, it would be different if we're like, you know, 43 or that goes out, which has a um, wider um, shoulder even. Um, so I think the traffic is an issue. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking back again, at residential housing, I'm thinking maybe people would like to live there who have children who would like to go to like Winona Middle School and live closer to a school district that their children would be going to. So I, I think assuming that this is, you know, the place where senior living is, um, is, you know, excluding, you know, people who might have children and have that uh, desire to go to schools in the area or to live near, they'd be able to go to schools. Um, I like, you know, once again, the, the project I think is great. The amenities are what seniors might choose, such as the one that's on Mankato or some of the other um, places, locations where we have housing for seniors. I just think Pleasant Valley County Road 17 is not the best location for this. And I'd like to maybe ask about what kind of market um, research has been done to you know, determine where is the best location for um, this type of housing in the city of Winona. Thank you, Thank you for your comments. Anybody else wish to speak? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, can you speak up, please? Uh, Chris Terrace, 22897 County Road 17. Um, I guess all I really have to say is that uh, I did talk to Michelle, uh, part of the project uh, coordinator there, and um, I did have some concerns. And I guess that's between me and, you know, the developer. Uh, I really don't think that uh, anyone else should be bringing my name into this right now. And... Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comments. Others who wish to speak, speak up. Can anyone hear me? Yes. This is Gabe Erickson um, in uh, 25475 on Pleasant Valley, um, County Road 17. Um, I just kind of echo some of the same concerns that Mike and Roberta and these guys have shared. I'm just kind of feeling like this is kind of a little, and maybe I don't know all the information, but this feels like a little haphazard um, rather than kind of sticking to a plan that the city has developed for expansion. This just seems like a, like a spur of the moment opportunity that comes up and I'm just not sure this is the right spot either. I mean, just thinking about, the hill coming up from the roundabout there. I'm not sure if we want a whole bunch more people spinning out in the winter and sliding on that road. It, it's kind of dangerous there. And um, I don't know. I'm just not confident that this is the right place for this. I feel like there's maybe better places in town. I, I totally understand the wanting to live in a nice, quiet environment. I mean, that's why I chose to live out here too. Um, but for this type of development, it just seems like there'd be a better place somewhere else. And maybe this land could be used kind of similar to cobblestone or some of the other developments we have, a little more spaced out um, residences. But that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. This is Sandy Sherkeith. I live at 2304 Viola View Lane Northeast in Rochester, Minnesota. I am one of the people um, on the list for a unit in this development. And I would just like to say that I think it is a good um, use of the land for a senior uh, housing facility. And the reason I think that is because I think seniors are less in need of city parks and sidewalks at accessing down to Winona than seniors are. I think this is not an appropriate place to be building a senior community because you don't have parks and sidewalks. What makes it a good place to build single family homes with children and, and young adults who need those things even more. So I think a senior facility actually complements this area much better than single family homes would because 
of the lack of parks and sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, if I can make one other comment, if, 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 senior family, if senior homes and individual homes are not appropriate because of the lack of sidewalks and um, the lack of planning for parks, then really the only thing you're leaving yourself open to is putting commercial in here. So I think the people who are living here near this who are complaining about that need to think about what they're leaving themselves open to going into this area. Thank you. Anybody else wish to comment? Yes, can you hear me? This is Allison Clemens, 23171 yes, County Road 17. Um, I do agree there is a need for senior housing in Winona. However, I do not agree how the three acres located at 228 39 County Road 17 fits into the criteria as urban residential. This request has already been up for a vote and was denied by the City Council on May 4th. And now the landowner and developer get a second chance. On June 8th, the Planning Commission had a 4-4 split vote which indicates to me there are many concerns how this proposal is being stretched to fit the developer and landowner's request. Although I'm not a, a, a developer, I honestly feel the whole development concept has been done backwards. The developers have a waiting list, deposits down, a beautiful website, a successful cooperative in Winona, excited residents waiting to move in, but no land with the correct zoning. I'm not really sure how that works, but um, I just think it's going on. I would think that you'd have the land first and then, and then go for the development. Um, I keep hearing how this development was, would be similar to the Winona Arms building in Knob Valley but I don't see the similarities at all, being that Knot Valley is an established subdivision with probably 30 to 40 to 50 homes in a church. Along County Road 17, there are three homes on four acres south of the Boo Blitz property and one home north of the property with about two to three acres of land. As you can see, this is a rural setting, not an established subdivision. At the last city council meeting, I heard about possibly having sidewalks in a few years along County Road 17. But in the meantime, there is a nice wide shoulder for the seniors to walk because the property is not connected to parks and open spaces. According to the Winona County Highway Department Traffic Volume Survey that was done in 2015, there are more than 3,400 cars that drive past Signatures and Bridges Golf Course per day. I cannot imagine that number has decreased by any means. I would invite any of the council members to walk on the nice wide shoulders between 6.30 and 8.30 a.m. or 3 to 6 p.m. The speed limit is 45, but that is laughable. As discussed at the last planning commission meeting, the proposed site is virtually an island. No matter how tall the building will be, it will not be in a neighborhood with a 35 mile an hour speed limit allowing people to walk their dogs on the side of the road. I feel this has been a matter of spot zoning on the city's part and trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The proposed site is not well connected to parks, open space, shopping and services as defined in the urban residential criteria. Thank you. Just remind the speaker that she's exceeded her three minutes. So if you could wrap it up, please. Well, I'm done, thank you. Okay, thank you. Somebody else wish to speak? Um, this is Erica Erickson. Okay, go ahead. Uh, 25475 County Road 17. Um, 
So I guess I just wanted to share, um, you know, I'm a resident in the neighborhood and my concern really is just um, how this is going to change the landscape and then also the safety as their previous um, speaker mentioned. So I'm hoping you can see my screen and this is a picture uh, taken from the bluff that's just on the other side of signatures and you can really see here that this development is really going to change the landscape um, and I don't think in a positive way. I'm also really concerned about just the safety of uh, the residents that would be living there in walking on that wide shoulder, which really as you know, a nurse and a first responder and someone that works at emergency medicine makes me nervous every day driving down that road um, that someone's going to get hit or something else, uh, something's going to happen. Um, so I just really think it's not in the best interest of our community um, to have a, a senior housing developed in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else wish to speak? Anybody else wish to speak to this issue? I'm going to ask one more time if anybody else wishes to speak. I'm Wilson Town Chair. I'm sorry. This is Leon Bowman, Wilson Town Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Address 2282 7 Garvin Heights Road. Um, you know, we're talking, I keep hearing about, you know, the nice, quiet neighborhood. You've got Gilmore Valley, Buckridge, Windcrest that are surrounded by the city and not Wilson. It seems to be that the cost of this property is a big issue because there's HUD money involved. I thought there was some issues that they could be worked out to put this in a nice, quiet, in a area that within the city of Winona, that there was some grant money and some uh, tax uh, stuff that, that could be worked out with the developer and the city. I also wonder why this is only look you're only looking at it for three acres when you're looking at nine acres for annexation to me that just that doesn't make any sense plus the fact that it would be considered at least for us to be spot zoning uh, i understand that you're going through your uh, comp plan and maybe that's the time to go through this and do a complete uh revamp of what you have on the books would make this whole situation a lot easier. And also, um, we do have an agreement not signed because we still have some technical issues to take care of on an annexation agreement. And I think that uh, this could all wait until that's all taken care of. All right, well, thank you for your comments. Anybody else wish to speak? Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Philip Heisey from 23017 County Road 17, an adjacent property owner. Um, I don't want to rehash the whole, I, I've listened to all the negative, and I agree with uh, basically all of that. Um, you know, this is the second shot at, at an approval and I don't really even believe it's the height of the building that matters. I mean, it, you're changing the zoning from something it's not. Yeah, I don't know if this is working. It's working. Okay, well, I'm getting some horrific feedback here. Anyway, uh, the, the, my biggest concern is is the changing of the zoning. The, certainly, uh, there is a lot of traffic on Pleasant Valley Road and it moves pretty quick um as other people have already stated uh thousands of cars a day um most of them probably ignoring the speed limit uh you know the other thing i'm very concerned about is the six acres that's not even in this plan but i've seen the original bradford development drawing that includes uh i think it's about 30 twin homes just packed in that six acres and I'm sure that's someone's nice dream for the future and I don't know if this is a way to get in the door with it or not with the changing the zoning and the annexing etc but we're certainly uh, not in favor of this development that's for sure 
And I'd just like to reiterate my uh, agreement with all the previous callers who uh, don't think it fits the, the plans or the zoning. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, I wasn't sure if it was audible. My name is Christine Krauser. I live at 22183 Pinecrest Road. And when I, I look out my backyard, I look across the uh, golf course and I see the bluff in the distance. And I really don't wish to see some multi-story building over there. Uh, I agree with the previous uh, comments that this is a nice, peaceful community. I actually moved to Winona because it was peaceful. And I'm very disappointed that we're trying to put in uh, uh, large multi-unit buildings on these county roads. I think it should go into the city limits and that would be better. And uh, we, we don't want to look, I don't want to look at that across my backyard. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Additional comments from people? Go ahead, speak up. Anybody else wish to speak? Anybody else wish to speak? I'll ask one final time if anybody else wishes to speak to this subject. Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing and open it up for the council to discuss. Well, I, Michelle Elder, would make a motion to approve the request and recommend the conditions under the option um, and accept the four attachments as provided. Is there a Councilman second Al. to that motion? Councilman Al Thurley here, I will second that motion. Okay, we have a motion by Michelle and a second from Al. Open it up for discussion, comments, questions. Mark, Michelle Alexander. Go ahead, Michelle. So I appreciate all of the comments that we heard and I understand that um, a development next door is not what any of you want. However, um, this has always been the long-term plan for the city of Winona. Over 15 years, this has been the plan. We used to have an orderly annexation agreement. We extended services. The plan um, before I was ever elected was to move the city and development up this corridor. Um, that's why we ran through we and water lines past this property. The thing about Winona is we've never taken land. Um, we never force people to hook up, but when they request it, we look at that request and the need of the community. And I have to believe that every person that signed the document wanting senior housing at a lower income or a more affordable cost in a cooperative type of situation decided that that was the place for them for a variety of reasons, none of which um, maybe are relevant to, to you or what you would want, but they're not looking for parks and they're not looking for sidewalks that they have to shovel. And they're not looking to be next to a busy uh, shopping center. They're all capable of driving a mile down the road to go shopping. Um, they're all capable of, there's gonna, if I understand correctly, this facility is going to have its own workout facility. None of the things that are being discussed are of interest to this group. And I have to look that the developer and the city who spent two years on this project picked the property that was gonna best fit the needs of not only the potential residents, but the community itself. And although we've talked about a lot of other places in the city of Winona, some of them are not available because they aren't, um, they're the state property or the, or the developer didn't wanna sell or they wanna develop themselves. So what we have here is a situation where a developer and a group of residents came together, came to the city and found a project that was gonna work. Um, for them. And I don't believe that they will build an eyesore. In fact, I think they will build it to complement the neighborhood, the area. The bluff will cushion it behind it. You won't see the cars they'll be parked behind. And I think it'll end up being 
a wonderful place for um, some of our seniors or older adults that want to move back to community or want to have a cooperative living agreement to, to cohabitate. All right, well, thank you. Mayor George here. Go ahead, George. Yes, hearing all the comments that were made tonight, uh, not for it and, you know, uh, being for it, whatever it all may be, but just on a couple of things, I just jotting down some stuff here is that uh, every development brings increased traffic. It brings more activity. They talked about the traffic on high on County Road 17. 17 is a well-maintained road. And where all that traffic comes from is the people from up above that are all coming into the city of Winona to go for their employment, which is understandable. The roundabout was put in at the bottom of 17 X amount of years ago, came under great criticism. The roundabout works very, very fine and hear a lot of positive feedback about that roundabout as I go through it several times myself. Uh, the turn lane, uh, Jen, I think uh, Mr. Luttrell talked about turning off on, on Blackberry Road. He almost gets rear-ended. Well, like I said, there should be a turn lane there if that does cover a lot of traffic and those things can be taken care of. And of course, that would be with the county. The annexation, we have a good agreement with Wilson Township for many, many years on annexing property that needs city services of water and sewer and some developments as well too. The pipe was put out there, I think 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, it's out there for that need as it was done, as I said, many, many years ago with it. The annexation process, uh, it gets worked through very, very well. Uh, both parties agree sometimes it's adversarial, but they tend to work it out and make it a very, very good, comfortable agreement for everyone on there. When I moved into West Burns Valley area back in 1979, in 65, this began to get developed. There were three homes out here. I ended up getting the last lot in this development where another 12 homes were built. Uh, Building happens. It happens out in the valleys. That's where people look to go. They say, you know, they're looking for peacefulness and quietness. Uh, you are definitely will have peacefulness and quietness with this group of people. Uh, if you go to single family homes, uh, one woman made mention that they perhaps, you know, maybe taking their kids to the middle school and things, that is going to bring three times the traffic of a husband and wife driving, the children driving, it's gonna increase it more than what this development will do. Thank you. Thank you, George. So, uh, Mayor, this is, this is ahead, Pam. Pam. Yes, yes. Uh, I am, am going to vote for this. I think uh, that this development is in a position at the lower end of County of the Highway 17. It's relatively close to town. And as uh, several people have mentioned, we've already uh, extended the utilities out in that direction, which has been uh, part of the part of the plan, perhaps not part of the not, not part of the uh, stated plan yet, but I think that it's been a logical development. My, my problems with this development before at the last vote were two things. One, I did not want to see us uh, annex by ordinance and, and possibly disrupt a, a relationship with the township. I didn't want to do that. And I was also a, a feeling that there was just too hot, too, the building was at too much height. It was too big for the shape of the bluff. And now I feel like both of those both of those problems have been have been um, changed, and I'm ready to vote for it. Okay. Well, thank you, Pam. Mayor Al here. Go ahead, Al. Thank you. Um, I voted for the initial uh, concept, and I'm glad to hear the developer came back with some plans that took into account some of the concerns who, that were expressed during that meeting. Um, and uh, as was stated earlier in this meeting, what these types of projects do is free up uh, single family homes within the community and making those available 
um, to uh, folks who wish to raise their families while the previous residents move into uh, housing concepts, something like this. And uh, it's, it's a win for the community, I think, and I'll continue to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Eileen Muller here. Go ahead, Eileen. Um, I uh, voted against this initially, and um, I received a lot of emails about it uh, from folks asking me to support the development, and I've taken all of those under consideration. Uh, many of the emails I received um, in favor of the development were from folks who do not currently live in Winona, and that I find, um, even though I value their input, and I, of course, want them to be community members here, um, I, I feel um, as a representative that I have to really give weight, especially to the people who currently live in Winona, and hearing so many people um, who live in the area speak out against this um, as it is, um, I, I really have to take that into consideration. I'm not opposed to this development. I'm not opposed to senior housing. Um, it's something I've been really in favor of. I really want to uh, free up um, some units in the city for single family homes. Um, but uh, I, I feel pretty strongly about following the comprehensive plan. I know it is outdated. Um, I'm guessing it will change when we update it. Um, and I would be happy to vote in favor of a development that fits into it at that time. But um, at this point, I'm still going to have to vote against this. Thank you. Council Member Schoenmeyer. Okay, go ahead, Paul. So I, you know, the, the arguments for and against have been uh, strong arguments. Um, I was, I voted against this initially and, and uh, I think it was important that we have an orderly annexation agreement with the township. I think, uh, and the reason why I said that is because it was clear to me when I was first elected that uh, Winona is going to grow and it's going to grow south. We can't grow uh, north. We can't grow across the river. We have one, one direction to grow. Um, the infrastructure, like uh, Council Member Borzakowski said um, earlier, the infrastructure was put in place years ago. Um, I think um, residents who live along County Road 17 um, may have been even opposed to that infrastructure improvement. Um, nevertheless, um, and those improvements were made. The infrastructure is there. These are, this is a logical, uh, one of the logical places or directions that we're gonna move. And uh, if it's not uh, uh, this development, it's gonna be another development. Um, it, it's, it's just gonna happen. Um, so I'm inclined uh, to vote in favor of this. Um, I will say, however, uh, I have heard from some that we have a developer from out of town coming to develop uh, land and, and this whole discussion about this not happening downtown. We have property owners and developers from Winona who own property downtown who know that there is a demand for this type of housing. But instead, they're deciding to build rental. And so this is a message to those property owners and those developers. Start building what we need in our community so we don't have to put it out on the fringe. I will be voting in favor of this. Okay, well, I guess I better uh, weigh in on this myself. Um, I voted against it the last time and I, I feel that was the right vote. I'm comfortable with that. Um, I understand the concerns, especially of the neighbors, about the project. Um, I do want to say, though, that I think that my main objection was the scale of the project. And I appreciate the developers uh, coming back with a, a different design, uh, a, a, a 
instead of a four-story, a three-story building. And uh, uh, certainly I feel more comfortable uh, with a three-story building than a four-story building on that location. And uh, for that reason, uh, I'm going to change my vote and I'm going to support it tonight. Um, I think that uh, I think the developers responded well to uh, a lot of the concerns that we had as a council uh, when this came up the last time. And, um, I know there's a need for it. We certainly have heard from many people that uh, very much want this project to go forward. And, uh, Willowbrook has been a very successful project. I know there was opposition to that when that was built, and I think that that turned out okay. I, I certainly hope for the same with this one. So unless, if there aren't any other comments or questions, uh, we can proceed to vote. Mayor George here. Go ahead, George. Yeah, they brought up about, you know, the mess that's out there right now, the piles of uh, wood and, and brush and all those things. And as this gets developed, all those things will be cleaned up. Okay. Any other comments or questions before we proceed to vote? All right. We'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Councilman Mo or Councilwoman Mollard. Nay. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borshikowski. Aye. Shulman. Aye. Motion passes. Six in favor, one against. Moving on to the petitions, requests, and communications. Item 3.1 is reappointments to the Heritage Preservation Commission of Connie Dretzky and Inez Henderson. So moved, Michelle Alexander. Council Member Schoenmeyer, second. All right, moved by Michelle and seconded by Paul. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borshikowski? Aye. Schulmeyer? Aye. Motion passes. Item 3.2, reappointments to the Recreational Waterways Commission of Tori Moore and Adam Peterson. Council so Member Schulmeyer moved to approve. Michelle seconds. Motion by Paul and seconded by Michelle. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Councilman Thurley? Aye. Moeller? Aye. Alexander? Aye. Iden? Aye. Borchakowski? Aye. Schulmeyer? Aye. Passes. <laughs> Item 3.3, reappointments to the Joint Airport Zoning Board of Al Thurley and George Borchakowski. Aye. Michelle Alexander, move approval. Second, Pam Iden. Motion by Michelle, seconded by Pam. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borshikowski. Aye. Schulmeyer. Aye. Passes. Item 3.4 is a license agreement request from Chase Hoffman to place a handicap ramp at 151 East 3rd Street. George, I'm Alexander. Alexander. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, second you, I'll George. Leave. I'll second, George. I'll, license. <laughs> I'll second, I'll second, Michelle. Uh, who made the motion, George? George, yes. Okay, motion by George and seconded by Michelle. Any <laughs> questions or comments? Eileen Muller. Go ahead, Eileen. Uh, just that I'm I'm so happy to see more of our buildings becoming uh, accessible, and I'm excited about it. Agreed. All right, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Muller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borshikowski. Aye. Schulmeyer. Aye. Passes. Item 3.5 is the Winona Area Youth Hockey Association report. All right, we'll uh, turn it over to Chad. Uh, 
Mayor and Council. Uh, Eric Dorowski is on the line with us tonight. Uh -oh. uh, she'll be giving an update from the uh, Illinois Area Youth Hockey Association. Uh, this is an annual uh, report that the Hockey Association provides to City Council. It's uh, part of uh, their agreement. And then Council has always asked specifically our department to have agreements uh, come before Council and give the annual report, much like Prairie Island Campground does with front porch management. Uh, however, the probably greatest difference here is that this will be probably much briefer than that just due to the nature of the license agreement. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Erica. Okay, Erica. Erica, are you there? Did you show up on the list? She was earlier. Okay. This is Brad, the IT coordinator. Um, Erica's microphone is not set up, <clears throat> so we'll have to do that. Could she hear you? Likely. Or she can join by phone. Okay, we'll give her a minute or two. Erica, can you hear us? You need to turn your mic on, I guess. Can we come back to this item? Yeah, why don't we do that? Let's come back to the hockey report later. Do we want to move on to 3.6? Do you want a motion to postpone until oh. she logs in? Or? We'll move to uh, delay this uh, agenda item until the uh, presenter is available. Second, I Michelle. Second that. All right, motion by uh, Paul, seconded by Michelle. Uh, all those in favor say no. uh, roll call vote. Mayor Peterson. <laughs> Aye. Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borzakowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. So that will we'll postpone until she logs in or. All right. So item 3.6 is a request for the 5K known as the BK 5K for Saturday, August 8th. And Paul Wisniewski is on the line. Paul, did you want to say anything? If you could unmute. There we go. That works better now. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council. Yes, um, we would like to see if on August 8th we could host uh, BK 5K. Um, originally, the race was scheduled for June 20th, uh, along with the Steamboat Days, as we have in the past. Um, with that being canceled, we look to move out to the date. Um, we are looking at only putting on a race that is uh, meets the MDH guidelines if we feel that we can keep people safe. Um, part of the changes to our race would be a two-hour rolling start, which means that you wouldn't have a mass start if people grouped together. We would space that time out. People can start when there's no one there. We would have spacing spots to keep people apart. No pre-event activities, no post-race activities. What we would do is ask people to come. They do their race. Um, we've mapped out a different course where we would run out on Lake Park Drive. Uh, they enter the bike path. There's about a 0.3 K of space where they actually would be people coming and going on the same path, but we can cone that to keep them apart. And then they would come back on the bike path to keep people socially distant. Um, at the end of the race, we would have just water, prepackaged snacks. They grab their things and then we ask them to go. So no real socializing afterwards. Um, that's what we're looking to do um, as we look to look at um, providing grants to the youth organizations, as well as we are also uh, approach the food shelf about doing a food drive on top of that. Um, we would provide some extra swag items for people who came if they brought non-perishable food items, if they wanted to donate those or money, um, we would then provide that to the food shelf and give them extra swag. So that's really what we're looking to do. If 
the governor or things change, obviously we would not put on a physical race. We would alter our race plan to more of a supported virtual race to where we would have people the weekend to go at their own leisure time, whether it's at the lake, wherever they would like to go, they would submit their time. Um, if they did come to the lake, we would have a window of time where we would offer water and snacks after they were done doing their walk, their run. Um, but we wouldn't have any type of formal race format. So that's that's what we're looking to do and asking the council to look at. How many years have you been doing this? Um, this is actually the, this was going to be the, well, it is the 20th anniversary of the BK 5K. It's the 10th year of it being part of Steamboat Days. Um, as this year, when we get through our grants, um, the BK 5K over the last 10 years will have donated roughly $2 million to nonprofit youth organizations in Winona. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to support the youth uh, organizations, especially at this time where all of their fundraising opportunities have pretty much been canceled or not available to them. Um, this is some way that um, our organization can still support them. Those are impressive numbers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion? Michelle Maybe. removes. Okay. Second, Eileen. Motion by Michelle and seconded by Eileen. Any discussion? Council Member Schulmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Mr. Wisniewski, uh, my question would be, will your volunteers be uh, following MDH guidelines and mask wearing when they're interacting with the participants of the race? Paul, you're we muted. can't hear you. Yeah, you're muted. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Erica. Can you hear me? Uh, Erica, could you hold on for a couple of minutes? We uh, moved on to the next item. We'll get right back to you. Understandably. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead, okay. Paul. So we would have a limited amount of volunteers this year because we are not going to be going across um, the highway where we needed more people for that support. Um, any volunteers we do have would have masks, gloves, um, hand sanitizer available to them. So if they did need to interact with anyone, they'd be able to. Um, for packet pickup or at post race, we actually will have plexiglass screens on tables so that anything that is given to someone will go through a slot in the screen. So there's a barrier between the volunteers and uh, the participants. All right, thank you. Thank you. Are we ready to vote? All right, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thurley. Aye. Muller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borzakowski. Aye. Schulmeyer. Aye. Passes. We will go back then to item 3.5. The Winona Area Youth Hockey Association report. Okay, well, I apologize to everyone for my technical difficulties. I had to try to call back in. Uh, again, this is Erica Jarowski. I'm a current board member of the association and I'm the current uh, acting treasurer. Uh, in terms of an overview of the 2019 season, it was another successful year. We had over 200 youth skaters participate in the program and that's been relatively consistent for the past at least five years. In terms of financial results, we had a net uh, positive cash flow of about $200,000, and that cash flow was used as usual to uh, pay down the debts we have related to the rink expansion. Uh, at this time, we remain very optimistic for the 2020 season, but of course time will tell how uh, the current COVID situation may impact the season uh, later on uh, within the year. Uh, one thing we do know already is that our gambling income has been already impacted by uh, the local closures that have been um, taken place uh, given uh, the requirements of the state. But obviously we're hoping that over time we will be able to make up that uh, missing ground. And with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from council? Uh, council member Schulmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Eric, uh, just wondering, are we in year uh, two? 
or three of the outdoor rink, and I'm wondering how that has been uh, doing and and how uh, its its use is coming along. Yes, um, and Chad may have to help me out with this a bit, but uh, yes, it's been a few years now. Um, I think when the ice is available, it gets heavily used. Um, but I know there has been challenges with weather in terms of uh, allowing that rink to be uh, usable. Thank you. Al, here was, was not a question, just a comment, Mayor, if I might. Go ahead, Al. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, whoever scheduled this report on a day like today when we, in some places, reached 90 degrees. Nice to be talking about ice hockey. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you just feel cooler, don't you? Exactly. <laughs> All right, any other questions? If not, uh, thank you for the report. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to the 3.7. Next is item 3.7. It's the Winona area mountain bikers donation of $12,000 for the Bluffs Traverse Project. Also, Member Schoenmeyer moved to approve the attached resolution. Michelle, I'll move that item approved. Okay, a motion by uh, Paul and seconded by Pam. Yes, that was Pam. Discussion? Uh, Council Member Schoenmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, who would have thought that uh, some mountain bikers uh, can come up with this kind of dough? I just want to thank uh, the members of WAM. Uh, for all the efforts that they've done in the past uh, for this contribution and for showing our community another example. This is two in a row uh, where we're working with uh, other entities to help build our, our uh, outdoor rec and recreational facilities and infrastructure. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Mark, Go Michelle ahead. Elder. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, this is my favorite thing about our community is the collaboration we have between different organizations that allow us to accomplish more than we ever could on our own. And I think uh, these are well loved um, trails that are well used not only by mountain bikers, but by others. And I think uh, this donation is going to be well used and I hope uh, sees a better outcome for our looks like our potential grants going forward and uh, our continuation of improving those trails. All right, thank you. Any other comments? We'll move the vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Morshikowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. All right, it passes. Item 3.8 is the restructure of the Winona Police Department, and Chief Bostrek is here to present. Mayor and Council, um, thank you. I just wanted to say we, I tried, get to, close. tried to make this uh, summary item as, as thorough as can be to kind of explain the reasoning, some of the logistical uh, things involved and uh, read the, the reasons for the moves um, and to keep it somewhat short at the same time. But I uh, just wanted to stress that because of a number of uh, pending retirements, we were able to make these moves, uh, plan for these moves, um, which have been needed for some time. And um, wanted to stress that the impact on the budget will basically be zero, if not a positive, will be a positive actually because of some of the overtime um, that sergeants are basically because of the nature of their job forced to work. And it will give us some, some better oversight for the department, which uh, I believe in, especially in these times is needed as well. Um, and basically if there are any questions that uh, you would have that weren't addressed in this, I'd be happy to answer those. One thing I will make a note of is this will not uh, decrease any um, officers on the street. So any questions that I could answer, I'd be more than happy to. Al, Al uh, here. Go ahead, Al. Uh, this, this continues the uh, 
uh, community officers that uh, have been so successful in the past few years, haven't, won't they? They will continue, absolutely. We've, we've seen um, the benefits from having those and we'll continue to do everything we can to keep those active, yes. And I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to do this before all of the other concerns about police officers uh, arose. And I think it's a good program and uh, I agree with the uh, reorganization as presented. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Mayor, no action uh, needed on this item. Mayor George here. Go ahead, George. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chief. As I talked with you this morning about that, to, you know, that will still be at full strength out on the street. And with uh, uh, the community outreach officers, I know just firsthand from uh, serving on other boards that it's definitely brought a very positive uh, uh, attitude towards, uh, towards some of the areas that they work in. And as you return to the station tomorrow, just tell all the women and men down there, uh, they do one heck of a good job and we really appreciate it and support them. I will certainly do that, thank you, and uh, appreciate that. Any other comments or questions for the chief? If not, thank you very much for your report and for being here tonight. We'll move on to the next item. Under new business item 5.1 is the downtown revolving loan fund. Uh, I'll call on uh, Lucy McMartin. Thank you, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, the city has had a downtown revolving loan fund for many years. And as you know, recently, the Council approved the downtown strategic plan. And one of the suggestions in the plan, one of the quick wins that was mentioned, was to take a look at this program to see if it could be modified and better used. So what we're proposing is a minor change, uh, but we think it will have an impact. Uh, right now we support 50% of a project up to $40,000 and we'll continue to do that. Previously, a quarter of the city loan could be deferred if you own the building five years and now it will be half. And instead of paying the city back at a 2% interest rate, we're proposing a 0% interest rate. So we think that these changes will uh, help participation. We haven't done a loan since 2017. Um, we do have a balance in the fund of approximately $175,000. So we think uh, through the implement implementation of the downtown strate strategic plan that this step uh, will help support uh, those goals approved a few weeks ago. I have a question, Lucy. Um, in your comments here, it says that it talks about the federal requirements and SHIP will review on some of these projects. Would SHIP will review no longer be required for the uh, uh, loan? No, uh, Mayor and members of Council, all of the federal rules will still apply. Um, and that has been part of the hindrance of using the program is uh, so we would continue with historic review and with Davis Bacon wages. But again, just making it a little bit more attractive. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Motion? I hey, make Ryan, a motion Michelle. to approve Michelle Alexander. Eileen, okay. I second. Motion by Michelle and seconded by Eileen. Any more comments or questions? If not, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Council Member Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Biden. Aye. Wyszykowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Passes. Item 5.2 is the final plat for the Target Lake Park Retail Subdivision. I, Michelle Alexander, make a motion to approve the attached resolution and accept the three attachments. Eileen, I second. All right, motion by Michelle, seconded by Eileen. Questions, comments? Mayor, George here. Right, George. Uh, is this part of where the new restaurant is going? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. 
Any uh, other Al, comments? Al here with a question. Go ahead, Al. Um, I noticed there is a sanitary sewer easement in in part of part of that. At least if if I read the map correctly, I guess I was looking at it online and then tried to blow it up and stuff. But I'm wondering if I'm assuming it's it's going to be fine. Just wanted to point it out. I'm sorry, I I didn't catch the question. I believe it was about a sanitary sewer main and. Certainly, as a site plan comes in, we'll take a look at that and the easement and make sure that there's no building over the easement. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mayor, I have a I have a comment. Go ahead, Pam. Um, yes, I. Um, this this development on the corner of Target and and Cato Avenue is another reason that we need to make sure we have safe access across Mankato Avenue as we go ahead and, and develop it. We need to be able to get pedestrians across there certainly certainly more quickly than they do now and um, also more safely. So that was just a comment. Thank you. I have a comment, Your Honor. Oh, go ahead. Just, uh, city manager just want to comment. say thank you to this developer and target for um, being creative with that space that they have right now, which hardly ever had anybody parking on it. So we're going to have a tax taxable property on that on that land. And um, on a personal note, to uh, finally have completed this mission that my father-in-law asked me to complete when I was first hired. So bringing uh, this Burger King back to town was at the top <laughs> of the list. So Scunny, mission accomplished. <laughs> I hope he's first in line. I'm sure he will be. <laughs> All right, I think we could vote. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Muller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borzikowski. Aye. Schulmeyer. Aye. Yes, Item 5.3 is the old wagon bridge Heritage Preservation Commission grant application. I, Michelle Alexander, make a motion to authorize staff to apply for the grant. Council Member I, I, I second that. Okay, a motion by Michelle and seconded by everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Pam. Pam, okay, we'll give it to Pam. Any questions or comments? Council Member Schoenmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. I don't know if anybody from the HPC is there or, or listening this evening. I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, this is, this is a really significant piece of infrastructure within our system, especially now since um, uh, the wagon bridge ties us into the flyway trail and the flyway uh, connector bridge. And so I guess my question is, um, does this uh, potential grant, uh, does this grant and the designation potentially uh, put us in, in position to get some grant money in the future uh, should we need some additional assistance to work on that bridge? Uh, I'm sure that I, I can answer that and the answer would be yes. Thank you for that short answer. Okay. All right, anything else? Mayor, George here. Go ahead, George. Yeah, like I say, I'm over that way quite a bit too. And like I say, it's uh, really, really That's getting- the fourth ward? Well, no, no, across the river. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I go over that way quite a bit. And uh, there is certainly uh, a lot more activity there. And I know I agree with uh, Paul that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a beautiful bridge. And I remember <clears throat> the struggle that we had back mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, trying to obtain funding for that bridge. And if I remember right, it was like uh, $2 million to rehabilitate in 2.5 or 8 million to remove it. Yes. And that was all city cost to the end. There's a lot of generous donors that uh, donate it to keep that bridge open and make it like it is. All right, anything else? If not, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. 
Aye. Borshikowski? Aye. Schollmeyer? Aye. Carries. Item 5.4 is the appointment of election judges for the 2020 primary and general election. I, Michelle Alexander, move approval. George seconds it. All right, a motion by Michelle, seconded by George. I would just like to thank all of these people for being willing to, uh, to serve as election judges. Um, it's a long day and it's very important, and especially now during the COVID-19 uh, concerns uh, to step up and be willing to do this. Council Comments? Council Member Schoenmeyer. Paul, go ahead. I want to thank uh, City Clerk uh, Monica for working on this. I, I do have a question about uh, how we're doing in filling um, our volunteer needs uh, or our needs for election judges. I understand that uh, in, in this, these pandemic times that uh, we have kind of a, a change in the, in the demographics of uh, our election uh, workers. And I'm just wondering how that's looking. Uh, Mayor and Council, at the present time, we do have enough workers signed up for the primary. However, it would be helpful to have a few more alternates in case anyone does become ill between now and the primary election day, which is about five weeks away. So if there's anyone out there who is willing to be an alternate, you can contact the clerk's office. I will say I am especially looking for those people who uh, affiliate with the Republican Party. We are a little short on Republican judges, but you can be either a Democrat or not affiliated with any political party. Uh, we're also encouraging the public to vote absentee, at which you can uh, sign up online or contact the Winona County Auditor Treasurer's Office to get that absentee ballot. So we are hoping that the turnout in person for the primary is lower. Um, I will assure the public and our election judges that we are taking steps to encourage uh, social distancing at all the polls. So if you do need to vote in person, it will be a safe place to vote. Uh, we are ordering supplies, uh, including plexig plexiglass shields for the judges to sit behind. We're encouraging the public to wear masks. All the judges will wear masks and have cleaning supplies. We'll have the area marked uh, to keep the social distancing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? Eileen, I have a comment. Um, Eileen, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, I just want to, um, uh, you know, uh, also thank the people who are election judges and also thank Monica. Um, I'm glad to hear that we're already ahead of safety um, precautions. And I, I also hope people will fill out the absentee ballot. I've never done one before and I got um, one in the mail and I, I applied to have an absentee ballot and it arrived uh, just last week. So it was very quick and painless. And if you can do it, I highly recommend it. Hey, thank you. All right, I think we can vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borzikowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Passes. Item 5.5 .5 is the Fastenal stipulation. I'd make a mo motion to approve the request. Eileen, I second. Okay, go uh, Motion by Michelle, seconded by Eileen. Anybody here that would like to explain this? Anybody that's listening? Is Keith Nelson on? There is one. There I is can one, explain one, it. One request. Chris Hood will, but there is, there is one uh, item uh, for council. It, it states in the second paragraph that Fastenal seeks to redevelop for its corporate headquarters, and that's not correct. This is just a, an office building that they're going to be uh, building there. 
Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I underlined that myself. <laughs> Did Chris want to say something? Yeah, just very briefly. Good evening, Mary and Council. The, the reason for the stipulation is that Fastenal is, uh, has filed with the district court a, um, an action to re-register land. They're in the process of uh, consolidating the land for their downtown office building. Uh, some of that land is abstract property. Some of that land is Torrance property. They want to make all the abstract property Torrance property. And so they, in March, they filed a legal proceeding in district court to do that because that's the way you have to do uh, re-registration of land for Torrance property. Uh, both the port and the city of Winona um, are listed in that action. And so um, the original plan was to just have legal count or have staff look at it, determine whether or not there were any issues. And if there wasn't, then legal counsel would submit uh, a letter response of no objection to it. Staff has looked at it, there has been no objection, but in the meantime, um, uh, Fastenal has determined that there's another issue that has to be dealt with, and that's what the stipulation involves. There's a line that HBC uh, has with respect to uh, their cable line in the area, and it part of it's in the, um, the city's utility easement and part of it's not. Fastenal would like all of it in the utility easement, so they're going to expand the width of the utility easement. So the purpose of the stipulation is so that HBC, the city of Winona, who uh, is the one that owns the easement, um, and Fastenal would enter into a stipulation basically saying that uh, this is the new easement area, and then that would be filed with their original application, and then ultimately the district court would um, issue an order and that would become the uh, uh, the final action. Thank you, Chris. Are we ready to vote? I, I just have an observation. Okay, go ahead, Al. Um, I appreciate um, uh, them having this uh, before us because I didn't know what a Torrens system property registration was, looked it up, and, um, you know, it's, it's versus an abstract, which is something I didn't know. And it was first developed by Sir Robert Torrens in 1858 in Australia. So there. Thank you, Al. <laughs> I think we're ready to vote. <laughs> Mayor, Hi, roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Aiden. Aye. Warshakowski. Aye. Schulmeyer. <coughs> Aye. Passes. Item 7.1 is council concerns. We'll uh, start with the first ward, Al Thurley. I have a chance here to unmute my uh, microphone. Um, just a reminder coming up is our primary election, as our clerk indicated, for election judges. And I believe uh, in the not too distant future, the uh, uh, League of Women Voters will be conducting a candidates forum, so uh, everybody's encouraged to uh, take advantage and learn something about the candidates you'll be voting on in the um, primary. And I've also um, received some uh, correspondence from folks who are still interested in seeing the Aquatic Center um, looked at again, and I I, I'm assured, I guess I would assume anyway, knowing the park Re recreation staff and how hard they worked uh, last meeting, that uh, they, they are continuing to look at ways perhaps to uh, open the pool, the aquatic center. Um, one of the suggestions the individual contacted me said that in order to give fairness that we create an online or a, or a telephone type registration system for swimming um, and another is to uh, look at other income sources, potentially partnerships or sponsorships for the Aquatic Center to help offset some of the costs. And uh, I think uh, those are something to be considered and perhaps the staff has already done that, but I'm just uh, encouraged by uh, the community response to uh, uh, still express interest in having the Aquatic Center open, I think is do all of us who were reluctant last meeting to have it closed. And also, I think we got a note uh, too, 
that uh, we all need to fill out our census forms if we haven't already. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Al. Eileen? Um, I have had a few people contact me um, asking, that actually, ever since I uh, started serving on council, I've had folks intermittently and then more, re uh, more people more recently mm -hmm. ask about um, why at the city level we don't have a public comment period before each meeting, similar to the county. And I know there are lots of differing opinions on why we do or do or why we don't do it currently. Um, but I, I would love for council to reconsider it. It's something that I think we can um, gain a lot from. I know that I'll, I've heard from a lot of community members that um, they feel like the the process to get something onto the agenda um, is either unknown or mysterious, or they're just never sure if the input they give is received by all council members. You know, for example, if they counsel that if they contact the representative of their ward and they want something brought forward, they don't know if it it'll ever actually make it to um, something upon which we can vote. So I just wanted to put that out there as something that we could uh, consider for the future. Um, and that is all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eileen. Pam? Nothing tonight. Thank you. All right. Uh, George? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, for the city manager, uh, why don't you tell Scunny that he can buy the first round of hamburgers at that Burger King? <laughs> I think it's going to be me. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, make sure you, you get the first round. Get your list together of who you're all going to buy for. <laughs> uh, I would just like to just send out condolences, first of all, to the family of Mike Cada. Mike, a longtime Fourth Ward resident who passed away last week, spent most of his working career with uh, the Dunn Blacktop Corporation. And to uh, his wife and his children and grandchildren, condolences on the passing of Mike. He was a very, very good very, very good citizen, very, very good man. And also to the family of Mary Kukowski, Mary who passed away last week, uh, offer condolences to, to her husband Butch and their children and grandchildren. And she also being a longtime East End resident, uh, just a wonderful woman. So wish both families uh, healing as they move forward. Thank you. All right. Michelle? Um, I don't really have any comments except for um, if we can ask the state to please cut the grass on Highway 61 near the Sinclair Severson lot and the McDonald's there. The grass is so high that when you're turning off there, you can't see oncoming traffic right around the signs. They've mowed everything else, but just around those signs, it's gotten so tall that you can't see until you almost creep into the other lane to get um to view across otherwise that's all i have tonight thank you paul thank you. uh thank you uh well council members thurley and moeller covered two of my three uh comments this evening the third would be and and maybe uh chad Ubel was listening um i have heard uh, a few people complaining about automobiles on the uh, on the flyway trail, as it were, which is the old highway, and I I understand that uh, we're working on an agreement with the state of Wisconsin to um, kind of prevent that from happening. But I, I just want that to be kind of uh, uh, something that's out there and that we're working on. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda, there are three items. Approval of the minutes from June 15th, a claim against the city by Matt Luce, and a claim against the city by John Pampu. Uh, Councilman Thurley here, uh, I move to approve the consent agenda. Michelle, I'll a second. Okay, motion by Al, seconded by Michelle. Any discussion? Very none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borzakowski. Aye. 
Schollmeyer. Aye. Passes. Mayor, if there is no objection, I move we adjourn. Second. I second. Motion by George, seconded by Michelle. I'm hearing no objections. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we got a vote. I guess we'll vote by roll call. And all this. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Alexander. Aye. Aiden. Aye. Borshikowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. And now the gavel. Steve said it was a powder grab. Oh. <laughs> Red journey. Thank you.